tell you what, I love that song. Today we're going to be talking about Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. Talking about the wrath of God being satisfied in Him. If you have your Bibles, please turn to Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22, we're going to be in verses 39 through 46. If you were here last week, you know we started a new series entitled Journey to Easter. And we are looking forward to the resurrection. Last week we talked about Jesus who came as our triumphal king. And now we're going to look at Jesus in the garden as he approaches the cross and what is before him. I'd like to begin by reading verses 39 through 46. The word of the Lord says, And he came out and went, as was his custom, to the Mount of Olives, and the disciples followed him. And when he came to the place, he said to them, Pray that you may not enter into temptation. And he withdrew with them about a stone's throw and knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And there appeared to him an angel from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and sweat became like great drops of blood falling to the ground. And when he rose from prayer, he came to the disciples and found them sleeping for sorrow. And he said to them, why are you sleeping? Rise and pray that you may not enter into temptation. Would you pray with me? Lord, we come before you and we ask for your help. Lord, I pray that we wouldn't fall into temptation. The temptation to fall away from you, to fall away from your word and the scriptures. Lord, I pray that you would, you would keep us. Keep us focused on the cross. Lord, keep us focused on the fact that the wrath of God was satisfied in you once and for all, for all sinners. I pray that you would help us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to see Jesus in the garden praying this morning. And I don't know about you, but I don't nearly pray as much as I should. But I heard this prayer, and I wanted to share this with you this week. It says, Dear God, so far today I've done all right. I haven't gossiped. I haven't lost my temper. I haven't been greedy, grumpy, nasty, selfish, or overindulgent. And I'm very thankful for that. But in a few moments, God... I'm going to get out of bed. And from then on, I need a lot more help. Amen. <laughs> Did you ever feel like that sometimes? We need the help from the Lord. And oftentimes we go to God in prayer. But we don't go to God nearly enough. But I want to ask you a question. When do you pray? And how do you pray? And why do you pray? When you go to God, when is it that you go to Him? Is it only when there is a crisis, when there is a problem, or do you just go to Him to speak to Him as a friend would speak to another friend? How do you pray? Do you say, Lord, I just need this. Give me what I need. You're going to supposed to give me everything I need. Is that how we pray? And why do we pray? Do we pray just expecting God to solve all of our problems right away? Today we're going to see Jesus going to God the Father, and we see it how a son would go to a father and ask. And I ask today, when you pray, do you pray as someone who is an outsider? Or do you pray as a child going to a father? Because oftentimes we can go to prayer and like this, Lord, I know it's been a while. I know it's been a while since I've talked to you, but I kind of need this. Or do you cry out to God saying, Lord, you're my dad. You're my father and you love me and you care for me. And I can bring my request to you. This is how Jesus prays to God in the garden. And so we are going to look at this passage and see his encouragement, his example, and a challenge for us. And so first we see the exhortation of Jesus. The exhortation of Jesus. He exhorts his disciples in these first passages. Look at verse 39 and 40. It says, And he came out and went, as was his custom, to the Mount of Olives, and the disciples followed him. And when he came to the place, he said to them, pray that you may not enter into temptation. So Jesus is with his disciples, and it's been an eventful week, right? He came in uh, with the triumphal entry. Everybody was crowning him as king, as Lord, and he has been going through the week. 
But here, they have just gotten done with a long night where Jesus washed the feet of his disciples. Where Jesus gave them the Lord's Supper and said, this is the bread broken for you as my body. He had just got done telling them that someone in this room is going to betray me. And so they've had a long, long night, a lot weighing on them. And it says, he went to the Mount of Olives as was his custom. Apparently this whole week they've been going into Jerusalem, doing things in the temple, and then returning to the Mount of Olives to sleep and to rest. And so they're coming back to the Mount of Olives. And if you remember from last week, this is a pretty important place. In Zechariah chapter 14, verse 4, it says that the Messiah is going to return in this area, in this way, at the Mount of Olives. And so Jesus comes back here, and it's the night before his death. And he's looking, and he knows what lays ahead of him. And Luke gives us a shorter description here than the other gospel writers, doesn't he? If you read the Gospels, you will see that there's some discrepancies in their accounts between Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And while they are saying the same thing, they don't always include the same things. And it doesn't mean that one's right or one's wrong. It's just as if three different people watched an event, they're going to describe it in a different way. And so Luke is very short in his description of this event, but we find out in Matthew's Gospel that it is called the Garden of Gethsemane. He doesn't give it a name here in Luke, but in Matthew's Gospel, he gives us the Garden of Gethsemane. We also see here that he says the disciples followed him, but in the other Gospels, we see that it is Peter and John and James who follow him. And so he gathers them together, and he tells them, pray that you wouldn't fall into temptation. Now, what's the temptation Jesus is talking about here? What is the temptation that he's asking his disciples to uh, not fall into and not enter into? Well, I think when we read the Bible, it's important that we read it in its context. That we look around and see what they have been talking about, what has been happening to inform us of what the Bible is saying. And if you go back to Luke chapter 22, verse 31, just a few chapters before, you see that Jesus foretells Peter's denial. He says, you're going to deny me three times, right? And he says this in verse 31. Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat. He's saying, Peter, look out. Satan is coming for you. He has asked to challenge you. We are in a battle, church. Oftentimes we don't realize it, but the temptation is that to fall away like Peter is going to be tempted to. To deny Jesus, to deny that he is the true God. And there is this temptation to fall away. In 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, it says, Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour and then in Luke chapter 22 in verse 3, this same chapter, just in verse 3, it says, And then Satan entered into Judas, called Iscariot, who was the number of the twelve. So we see, church, that we are in a battle. And oftentimes we don't realize it, but the enemy is out there, and he is lurking, and he is trying to pull us away from God. He is trying to take our focus off of Jesus. And I think for us, in our culture at this time, I think the main way he does that is that he distracts us. He keeps us distracted with all these other things in life, and we aren't even focused on the gospel. I heard a friend tell me a joke uh, this week. He said there were two scarecrows sitting, or two crows sitting on a uh, power line, and they were looking down. They said, well, I'm going to fly down there and get some uh, food out of that garden. And one of them said to the other, no, there's someone out there. You can't go right now. There's someone out there. And he said, oh, no, that's a scarecrow. He said, you don't know if that's a scarecrow or not. He said, yeah, I do know it's a scarecrow. He said, how do you know? He said, well, he doesn't have a phone in his hand. <laughs> but isn't that so true of us that we are a distracted people? That we are focused on our phone and all of these other things. C.S. Lewis, he wrote uh, the screw tape letters. And it's from the perspective of a demon writing to another demon, telling him how to pull Christians away from Jesus. And he says this. The demon is speaking. He says, you no longer need a good book, which he really likes to keep him from his prayers or his work or his sleep. He says, a column in yesterday's newspaper will do. You can make him waste his time, not only in conversation he enjoys with people he likes, but in conversations he cares no, with people he cares nothing about on subjects that bore him 
you can make him do nothing at all for long periods of time. Have you ever had your phone out and done nothing at all for long periods of time? I think that's the enemy's plan for us. He doesn't have to tempt us to do all of these things. He just has to keep us distracted. And as we are so distracted and with our eyes not focused on Jesus, it's so much easier to fall away, isn't it? And so Jesus tells the disciples here, pray that you wouldn't fall into temptation. Pray and keep your heart and your mind set on Jesus Christ that you wouldn't fall away. And so he exhorts his disciples here. Next, we see the prayer of Jesus. The prayer of Jesus. Look at verse 41. And he withdrew from them about a stone's throw and knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And there appeared to him an angel from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling to the ground. Jesus goes, and his disciples are with him, and he separates, and he says, I have to go over here and pray. I think in this prayer of Jesus, there are some important theological implications that we need to pull out of this. And so I have three points, three theological themes and implications we need to learn here. I know you were looking at the bulletin thinking, we're going to get out of here early. He's only got three points, but I've snuck another three in here. Um, But in the prayer of Jesus, first we see that Jesus is the God-man. Jesus is the God-man. He is fully God and fully man. And in this passage, we see both on display. Jesus is looking ahead to the future, and he knows exactly what is going to happen. His deity is on display, but his humanity is also on display. In verse 41, it says, he went and he knelt down and prayed. Now, anytime we think of people praying, we would imagine them kneeling, right? Oftentimes, we think, that's, I mean, that's why we have the altar here. That's why we have in our mind that people would kneel down and pray. But in this time, for the Jews, they would not pray by kneeling. They would stand with their eyes towards heaven with their hands up and they would speak to God in that way. And so Jesus coming and kneeling here is more likely translated as he fell down. He falls down. He is exhausted. He is overwhelmed at the horrors that he is about to face on the cross. He is overwhelmed and overcome. And in his humanity, we see that he falls on the ground to plead with God. So we see that he falls on the ground. Next, we see that angels appear to strengthen him. In verse 43, it says, an angel from heaven came and strengthened him. You know, oftentimes in the Bible, we see angels as messengers. They come and they are heralding this message and they are sharing this message with us. But angels are also, con- are also there to minister to us. In Hebrews chapter 1, it says that God sends angels to minister to us. And if you remember Jesus, when he left the temptation of Satan, where he was in the wilderness for 40 days, what did he do when he came out? He was ministered to by angels. And so we see the humanity of Jesus in his grief, in his sorrow, in his agony. The angels come and they are ministering to him. And then finally, we see his humanity in verse 44. Being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling to the ground. Luke, the the writer, uses a simile here. He says his sweat is like great drops of blood. he's, He's using this analogy to say he is sweating so much because he is under so much duress. It's like if you were to cut your hand and blood was to start pouring out. That is how the sweat is coming off of Jesus. He is so overcome by what he is about to face that he is in agony, drenched in sweat, on his knees, crying out to God. And we see the humanity of Jesus here. And I love this picture of Jesus praying. Because oftentimes, if you have in your mind a picture of someone who prays, what is it? It's probably a priest with a collar on, and they're sitting, and they're, they're very pious, and they're sitting there, and they're praying kind of quietly. We don't have a picture here of a priest quietly biding his time, but we have a warrior engaged in battle. We have Jesus on his knees crying out to God. He is sweating. He is overcome, and he is crying out. And for us, we don't need to be sitting here pious and just sitting here biding our time, but we need to be warriors on our knees begging to God for help. And so we see Jesus, the God-man. He was fully God, and yet he was fully man. 
Next, we see that Jesus is the only one who is able to drink the cup. Jesus is the only one able to drink the cup. He is the only human to ever live who was perfect, who never sinned, who was spotless. And it says in verse 42, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Most people agree that the cross is horrific, that the cross is gruesome and terrible. But the cup that Jesus is referring to here, I don't believe, is just the physical torture that he's going to endure. But the cup is the wrath of God poured out upon him. He realizes that the entire just anger and wrath of God is about to be poured on him for the sins of the whole world. And I believe that is why he is so tore up in the garden. When we think about Uh, The Jews, they would have to come and they would bring animals to sacrifice to God. And if they had sinned, they would bring an animal that they thought was one of the best animals without blemish. And they would have to kill it. And that blood would be poured out on the altar. And it says that the aroma of that animal burning and the blood would go up to God as a pleasing aroma. God's wrath and his holiness and justice, it has to have a blood sacrifice. Now, you might say, well, that's kind of barbaric and that's kind of mean. Can't we figure out another way to where people don't have to be killed for God's wrath? But let me ask you this question. Is God a good and wise and loving creator? He is holy and good and wise and loving. And if God allows sin in this world to go without punishment, then he can no longer be considered a good or wise, or loving creator. If God will let people pass for child abuse, then you can't call him a good or loving God. If God will allow human trafficking to happen and say, yeah, it's all right, we'll just forgive that, then he can't be a good and loving God. But his justice and his goodness demands wrath. It demands punishment for sin. And so, you have the Jewish people who would come year after year, day after day, month after month, and they would bring these animals, and they would spill their blood, and then what would they have to do? The next year, they would have to do the same thing over and over and over again, because none of them were perfect. But here, we have Jesus, the perfect sacrifice who God could pour His wrath out on once and for all. And those animals, they would come and they wouldn't have a clue what was about to happen to them. But Jesus is in the garden and He knows exactly what is ahead of Him. He knows the wrath of God is coming and He willingly accepts it. He is the perfect sacrifice for us. So Jesus is the God-man, fully God and fully man. He is the only one able to drink the cup. And then finally, Jesus submits to the Father's will. Jesus submits to the Father's will. He's begging with God, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. God, please, there has to be another way to endure the wrath of God on my shoulders for all mankind. There has to be another way. God, if you are willing, please remove this cup from me. But then look what he says. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Jesus submits to the Father. He says, you know what, God? I wish there was another way because this is horrible. But nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. When you pray, do you pray like that? God, here's my request. Here's what I'm asking for, but not my will, Lord, but yours be done. I wanted to submit to the Father and what He has for me. You might be crying out, Lord, I need a new job. I need to get out of this job that I'm in. I need need a new job. But not my will, your will be done. God, I've been persecuted. I've been uh, in this hard time. I've got all these things going on. God, deliver me out of this situation, but not my will, but yours be done. Or maybe, God, I got diagnosed with cancer, and I'm really praying that you would heal me. But Lord, not my will, but your will be done. We have some dear friends, a sweet family. Um, They have three boys, um, and then they are fostering two teenage girls. And the husband found out a few months ago that he has stage four colon cancer. 
and the outcome, it's not looking good. The prognosis is not looking good for him. And we've been praying for him and asking the Lord to heal him. And through it all, he has been saying, you know what? If God can use this so people can know him, then it's worth it. And through it all, he has been saying, you know what? I was able to talk to this doctor. And I was able to talk to this nurse and these people who I would have never come in contact with. And I was able to share the hope of heaven with them. He can truly say, Lord, please heal me from this, but not my will, but your will be done. Have you ever had a prayer that went unanswered? You've been praying and you said, you know, I'm in the word. I'm praying. I'm seeking him. I'm doing all the right things. I'm coming to church and he's not answering this prayer. And you think, God, why are you not answering my prayer. Here in this passage, we see that God not answering a prayer leads to the salvation of the entire world. Do you catch that? Jesus is asking him, remove this cup from me. But God doesn't answer his prayer, does he? He says, no, I've got something else. God not answering Jesus' prayer here leads to the salvation of the entire world. And so for you, whatever you're going through, I encourage you to pray, Lord, Here's my request, but not my will, but your will be done. So Jesus submits to the Father's will. So we see the exhortation of Jesus to the disciples. We see the prayer of Jesus. Finally, we see the example of Jesus. Look at verse 45. And when he rose from prayer, he came to the disciples and found them sleeping for sorrow. And he said to them, why are you sleeping? Rise and pray that you may not enter into temptation. There is a contrast here between how the disciples act in prayer and how Jesus acts. And I know it's easy to be hard on the disciples, right? Because they fall asleep. It's like, don't fall asleep. You need to be praying. I don't think Luke points out this to to cast the disciples in a bad light. I think he points this out to show us that Jesus is our example. He can do what we can't. While we will fall asleep, he will stay awake and he will pray. It says the disciples are found and they are sleeping for sorrow. The disciples had had a long week too. And the disciples had had a lot going on that night. Jesus had come and washed their feet. Jesus had told them that he was about to die. This person they'd been following for three years. He told them that Judas was going to betray them. And they were all wrestling this. Peter had been told that he was going to deny Jesus. And it was a too much on them. And they go to the garden to pray and they just fall asleep. As I've been studying this passage, I had lunch with a friend this week. And they've had a lot going on in their family. They've been dealing with sickness. And they've been dealing with a change in job and all of these things. And he said, man, the days are really long. And, you know, most days I'm just looking around like, oh, it's too much. I need to go, like, take a nap. I just need to go, go, go to sleep. And I thought about the disciples and how sleep and rest is a, a welcome relief from the stresses of this world. And how often we say, you know what, God, it's just too much. I just need to check out for a little bit, right? And our response to the pressures and stresses of this life is, you know what, I just need to Netflix and chill. I just need to, to, to kick my feet up for a little bit and not think about anything. But what do we see here in Jesus? When he is the most stressed and anxious he's ever been, what does he do? He goes to the Father in prayer. And for us, if we are stressed, if we are anxious, if we are overcome, we don't need to check out for a little bit, but we need to check in to the Father. And we need to go to him and pray. I'll close with this. I don't want you to walk away feeling guilty that you don't pray enough. We could all probably pray more. Um, But I do want you to know that there is grace in Jesus Christ. There is grace in Jesus Christ. Go back to Luke chapter uh, 22, the same chapter, just a few verses before in verse 31. Luke 22, 31. He tells Peter that he's going to deny him. And look at what he says. Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat. But look at verse 32. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. Jesus is praying for Peter. What an incredible statement that the king of heaven is praying for him. 
He says, I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. Jesus knew. He knew that Peter was going to fall away. But he had prayed for him that his faith wouldn't fail. He knew Peter was going to deny him at the moment he needed him most. And yet he prayed for him. He says, after you have failed me, then turn and strengthen the brothers. He says, at your worst, that's not the end of your story, but there's grace because I've taken on the wrath of God for you. There's grace because I am going to give you new life. There is grace because Peter, the one who denied me, I'm going to build my church on him. And so if you fail in prayer, if you fail to hit the mark, if you fail to live the Christian life perfectly, guess what? There is grace in Jesus, the one who set his eyes to the cross for us. In the beginning, in the Garden of Eden, we know that Adam and Eve sinned. Adam and Eve disobeyed God in the Garden, and it led to all mankind finding sin. And we are all sinners in need of a Savior. But then you fast forward to this Garden, where Jesus set His eyes on the cross. And he says, the curse of that garden is going to be reversed as I set my eyes to the cross in this garden. Romans chapter 5, verse 19 says, For as by one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so that by one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. In the first garden, sin entered the world for all of us. And now here in this garden, Jesus says, I am going to atone for that sin, and bring salvation for everyone. The first garden brought sin, the second garden brought atonement, and there is a final garden that brings us hope. In Revelation chapter 22, verse 1, it says, The angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city, also on either side of the river, the tree of life with his twelve kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. Church, there is a garden we are looking forward to where everything will be made bright, where Jesus will be ruling and reigning, and we will serve him perfectly. Church, that is our hope. Jesus has prayed for you. He will continue to pray for you. Will you surrender to him in prayer? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. God, we come to you now. Thankful. Thankful, Lord, that you saw the cross. You saw the wrath of God being ready to be poured out. And you said, not my will, but yours be done. God, I pray that you would help us to pray like that. I pray that you would give us a heart like that. Lord, thank you for the cross. Thank you for the blood of Jesus. And Lord, I pray that you would help us to follow you. Help us to remember what you have done. To focus our eyes on Jesus and to not fall into temptation, but to press in harder to you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.